Right, welcome to this very brief crash course in TOGAF 9. Um, we have been training TOGAF 9 for quite some time now actually, since its release uh, in February. And in the process of going through this exercise, we have identified certain key topics which we feel um, sit well within our audience. And that's what this course is going to do. I'm going to take you through a two hour session on the whiteboard just to take you through some of the core concepts um, of TOGAF 9. We do offer level one and two certification. These are five day courses whereby you write a certification exam and you will be TOGAF 9 certified, which is internationally recognized uh, and a very good credential to have on your CVs. And we provide training within that space. We then also provide a level three training exercise, which is an advanced training in which we look at more ent enterprise capability development, uh, systemic enterprise architecture, looking at the whole system. We then look at um, the value of enterprise architecture, how to link it to strategies using strategies, strategy maps and balance scorecards, that kind of stuff. And then finally, or well not finally actually, we also have an applied course, which now takes you through practical examples, also over a five day period. And finally, we have a mentoring QA ex exercise called Kickstart, which is a consulting exercise in which we help you build a straw man model of your strategic architecture. And then mentor you down the cycle to build your segmented and capability architectures. But this particular one is to give you a quick bird's eye view of all of those concepts, how they all fit together, and giving you a couple of gems which don't traditionally exist in a lot of the TOGAF documentation. So I'll be spending a lot of time on the whiteboard, um, and time permitting, take some questions from the, the audience, and uh, we will then um, uh, effectively, hopefully, have given you that, that, that view of the, uh, the TOGAF um, framework. Okay, so, all right, so effectively, one of the issues in architecture is everyone's asking where's the value, where's the agility? And what TOGAF does is actually packaged very well in its process around what we refer to as creating building blocks. And the concept of a building block has been around way before service-oriented architecture or any of those things came into play. And TOGAF is now the methodology that's going to help one extract building blocks, group them together in some kind of bucket for reuse across the enterprise. And if you can commoditize your thinking into a series of Lego blocks, and that's what we'll be referring to these as, then you can string those Lego blocks together in any way that you so desire, thereby creating your differentiator. So, uh, for this regard, just a quick example. So if we're effectively looking at a series of building blocks that we want to assemble, TOGAF takes you through the exercise of identifying these building blocks. And then sitting on top of this, you begin to build what is referred to as your differentiators. Right, so in other words, how do these string together these building blocks in any kind of coherent way? So let's take make coffee. If I want to make coffee, there are different, there's a different process that each of us are going to follow. So one particular individual will make coffee by putting in the milk first, then adding the sugar, then the coffee, and then stirring it. I mix mine into a paste, then I add the milk, a little bit more milk, a little bit of hot water, but ultimately in a goal-based world, we have to make coffee. Now, all of those components are actually building blocks. But semantically, there are different people that view the world and operate quite differently that sit at the top here. And they string together these building blocks in a vastly different man fashion. So this is often the how space. And this is often, well, is the what space. So these are the two worlds that we need to interact with. And everything about architecture relates to these two concepts. If you do not understand these two and how they differ from each other, you will fail in your architectural exercises. Your SOA exercises will not be successful. Projects will develop into silos. Integration costs will reach overrun because now we're trying to integrate different meaning together at this level. So it all boils down to the architecture, to enterprise architecture, and how it all strings together. And ultimately, this sits at the top here, in which this is actually referring to process. In other words, how I do something. And this is referring to function. In other words, what I am doing. And there are a number of businesses that we go into in which they have absolutely no idea right, what they actually do as a business. They know how 
and they're going through large process exercises to assemble all of this together. They have 30-man teams just governing this and the complexity of this. And a little later, I'm going to deal with the, the maintenance issues around it, specifically on the SOA space. But now, why I start a TOGAF introduction with this particular concept? Because TOGAF itself is done in exactly the same way. And all the building blocks and all of the efforts that we go to within the TOGAF landscape sit around those two functions. And as a matter of fact, not even within the TOGAF landscape, within any of the other architectural frameworks. If you have an understanding of that separation, you will have hit almost a silver bullet within the architectural landscape. So, quick summary of TOGAF. In TOGAF, we have a bucket. And you could look at this as a Lego box with all bits of Lego pieces in it. This Lego box right, is split into two areas. This is called the architectural continuum. And this is called the solutions continuum. And the whole box is actually referred to within TOGAF as the enterprise continuum. And what you've got to do is you've got to see that as a box over there that stores all of my artifacts, stores all of my building blocks that I've created in the organization. Now what we do when we go through a cycle of developing architecture is we effectively go through a method to build architecture and we add building blocks to that and or consume building blocks from that to build what is referred to as an architectural model. And at the top here, is an architectural model. And that, in a very, very high metastructure level, is really all TOGAF does. It gives you a lot of tools and things along the way, but it has a bucket, it has a method, and it has deliverables which come out on the other side of this. And TOGAF 9 has introduced a lot of interesting new concepts that flesh this out a little more, but the primary addition is sitting at the bottom here, and it's referred to as the content framework. In other words, it is a meta model to help you identify what types of building blocks you need to build. So, for example, I could have an application and I need to determine what processes this application is automating, how it relates to data, and effectively, let's change the pen here, this is what we're dealing with. So it's just giving us a view and a semantic view of what the architectural landscape looks like. And this is referred to as a meta model. And each of these are a type. In other words, our building blocks that sit within here could be of type application, of type process, of type data. So it is the structure which underlies all of this. So it is my lowest level within my domain. And you'll often see within the architectural landscape, businesses before they start on an architectural exercise is we need a meta model. And this is a good place to start because it tells you what information you need to do architecture. The problem is, is that people look to the tools to provide this and automate it without first understanding their own architecture and their own information discipline. And we'll touch a little later on that around the operation model. Okay, so I'm going to make a note here, which we can come back to. So that is a meta model, and that categorizes, all right, according to a standard, what types of building blocks I can use. And that's the, the new addition that the content framework has, has added. It basically sa said, don't waste your time building uh, a content meta model. We've got a standard one for you, of which you can extend depending upon how you understand your particular businesses. This is the base entry level. So if, if, if everyone worldwide now who is TOGAF 9 compliant baselines on this meta model, when I talk application to you, you will understand what I mean. If I talk process, capability, function, goal, strategy, all of those things will make sense to you because we're actually operating at the same language. So it is your building blocks, for, for lack of a better word, of architecture. So within those building blocks, we now can categorize them across this particular bucket. And at this level, we have what is referred to as a foundation architecture. And this is almost your lowest level. Actually, let me rather say your highest level. Because I have 
something like that which occurs, which means I go from the general to the specific. So over here is my foundation architecture. This is referred to as my common systems architecture. This one is referred to as industry architecture. And this one is organizational architecture. So if I have a bank, for example, an ABC bank, when I build my architecture for ABC Bank, it's going to sit there. At this level here, I might have broad reference models that I can use, of which TOGAF provides you with some. So over here, they have what's referred to as a technical reference model. Over here, they have common systems architectures. And that's traditionally the space of well, what's an ERP architecture? What's a security architecture? What is an integration architecture? And that's exactly what they've provided in the triple RM, which is one of the reference models which comes from TOGAF. So it is a common systems architecture. Further on down the line, you have your industry architectures. So things like SCORE, which is a supply chain operations reference model. ETOM. A lot of the vendors provide models within this space that you can build upon, which you will eventually customize to give you your industry architecture. An interesting point to remember about those industry architectures is in actual fact, they are your building blocks. So companies like IBM and Oracle will traditionally sell you this stuff in the form of a capability model or in actual fact, it is a what model. And all you need to do now is understand from your business perspective, what are your differentiators? In other words, what makes ABC Bank different from XYZ Bank down the road? They both went to the same provider, IBM or Oracle or whoever, bought the same set of building blocks, but we now need to understand what the process differentiator is. And architecture is, is most successful when you have both of these in place. So you need to have your what space and your how. So we're back to the what and how again. And these are the elements that you're traditionally going to buy within this world here. Companies don't necessarily want to sell or advertise their differentiators, but that's what gives them their market edge. So you'd be find it very hard to go out and buy a banking process model. You would traditionally buy mainly a functional model or some element of capability, depending upon the language that they've called it. IBM, for example, refers to business services and capability models, but they still fit within this space here. So here is my bucket. And that's exactly what this bucket does. I go through the exercise of categorizing all of my building blocks from the general all the way down to the specific. So that's your categorization system, and it's across the architectural continuum as well as the solutions continuum. So I can also have, uh, at the foundation architectural level, I can have products and solutions, I'll have common solutions, I'll have industry solutions, and I'll have organizational solutions. So this whole space here is my, my solutions environment. I'm going to talk around how that relates to the solutions architect and where he fits into that picture. So this is the bucket that I now work with. So where does a reference model actually fit in? If I have a meta model, and the meta model is telling me the types of building blocks that I have, a, a reference model is merely a collection of commonly used building blocks. So as I iterate through the cycle of building architectures for my company, I'm going to take certain building blocks and cluster them uh, in, in, in particular layers. In other words, this could be my business services layer. This could be maybe my information services layer. This could maybe be my composite process layer. Whatever the case might be, depending upon the reference models you build, as you do more and more architecture, you actually start to build a pool of your own reference models. And that's all that reference models are. They are a specific way to collect the building blocks that are already sitting in here. That's why they've given you a TRM and a triple RM. That's, that's your starting point for those collections. So it's important to remember how you position your reference models within the triple RM. So this goes to show that you can apply any reference model into the structure. You can slot in reference models for the Department of Defense. You can slot in reference models that are already part of FIF, which is a federal enterprise architecture framework. They've got performance reference models, data reference models, business reference models. Those things are synergistic with this big bucket. And that's what TOGAF has sought to do. It's sought to abstract itself away from very specific alignment to certain industries. So that's almost like the meta architecture framework layer. So what about things like the Zachman framework? Where does this framework actually fit in? 
is it synergistic with what we're seeing here? And when we expand a little further, I'll, I'll, I'll show you where it actually fits in. All right, so that's very briefly a, a definition of the bucket. Now, it's fine for me to have this bucket, but how do I use the bucket? And that falls into the domain of what's referred to as the ADM, which is the Architecture Development Method. And the ADM starts at the top here, which is what, what's referred to as the preliminary phase. All right, it then has what's referred to as an architecture vision. We then do business architecture. We then do information systems architecture. We then do technical architecture. We then do uh, opportunities and solutions. We then do migration planning. This level. We then do implementation governance. And we then do architecture change management. Sitting in the middle of all of this is requirements management. And they all feed into this cycle continually through the life cycle. So this is the ADM. And the ADM, in, as a, in, in fact, can be used across a, a variety of different solutions domains. Uh, it can be used across the architectural domain. You can even use it for solution design. So you're not limited to just use this particular method to just do architecture. Now, the ADM can consist, uh, let me just do that to create that separation, can occur at three particular levels. And this is now referred to as the architecture partitioning. And for example, in, the, in some of the federal spaces, it's referred to as architecture segmentation. And what it means is at the top here, I have a strategic architecture, which is a long-term view of how I would view the whole enterprise and its business. I can then break that up, depending upon the scale of the organization, into what's referred to as a segmented architecture. And then each of these, in turn, will break up into what are referred to as a capability architecture. So this is referred to as partitioning of your architecture. And depending upon where you are in the organization, the maturity of your organization, the maturity of your architectural practices, all of these things, all of those elements can dictate where you're sitting within the structure. Mature architectural practices and organizations have a strategic architecture in which they've built a three to five year view of where they want to go and it's broken down into segments with associated capabilities that are being built. Some organizations start a little smaller and they actually only work within this environment here. And you, only, you may only have a division that's doing enterprise architecture. You know, my argument is, well, if you only have a division doing enterprise architecture, are you actually doing enterprise architecture? Because your scope has then come down and you're only providing it for a small subsection of the business. But this whole division could be the customer's department for the revenue service could be as big as that. So that in itself is an enterprise. So it's important to remember that I can create a segmented architecture in the broader perspective of, let's say, the revenue services or a government department, but I can still do an enterprise architecture for that particular division. Ultimately, my goal is to try and link it in to the strategic level so that I get synergies across all of these government departments. And that's where value comes in. Just the same as I've got a what space, and at the top, I can get the true value by pulling my differentiators in, even at this macro space. If I do these things well, true synergy starts to emerge at the top. So this is the segmentation of your architecture, or in TOGAF terms, the partitioning of your architecture. And you would use the exact same ADM to do each of these. I would use the ADM to do a strategic architecture, the ADM to do a segmented, and the ADM to do a capability architecture. So you'd go through the same process. You would just go to different levels of detail. Some broad, some deep T approach, um, thousand foot, depending on all the different terms that one has applied, that's how you would apply the same method. So it's always good to apply the same method across all of these partitions. Don't use different methods because then you're going to confuse the language that sits within the architectural landscape. So that is the partitioning of your architecture. Next important point to remember is the iteration of your architecture. Over here, you have what's referred to as architectural context iteration. 
in which I look at my preliminary phase, which looks at things like EA strategy, your EA operating model. Um, it looks at things like frameworks, which frameworks you can introduce, some of the principles, stakeholders of architecture. All of that sits in the preliminary phase. And my vision phase, which effectively looks at what is my vision for this iteration. And that's often where people misunderstand the architectural vision within the ADM. This vision right, is actually within a loop, which means that it is the vision for this iteration. So that vision might be strategic, segmented, or a capability vision. So each of those spins out in their own way and will each have their own architectural vision. But sitting above this is the preliminary phase. And it guides each of those iterations. So this is an exercise which doesn't occur within each iteration. That's why the preliminary phase is outside. And this is all about building my architectural capability. We'll talk a little around some of the maturity models that can sit within that space. So that is the architectural context iteration. All right. You then have, and there are sc various schools of thought which differ, but I prefer this particular one which is the architecture development iteration. So this is basically building your architectural blueprints. And in here, I build my business blueprint, I build my data and my application blueprint, and I build my technology blueprint. And those are the domains. They're referred to as domains of TOGAF, in which we have business, data, application, technology. As an organization, we like to add another two. So over here, we put organizational and information. So you get the good acronym of BOIDAT. But TOGAF is BDAT specific. It doesn't concentrate too much yet on the information and the organizational layers. So those BDAT domains effectively run down here as well. So I would categorize my building blocks for my architecture continuum and my solutions continuum across those domains. So I could have a foundation architecture business building block, a foundation architecture data building block, application building block, technology. Same over here, I could have a common systems business building block, a common systems data building block. I could, at this level here for products and services, I could have a s products and services related to uh, foundation architecture category and related to business. So all of those things carry through within my particular bucket here. And don't confuse this with you have to have a perfectly defined Lego block that has to fit in here. Your principles all right, that have, may have had an impact on certain architectural decisions all the way down can also be linked in here as building blocks. But they in turn will link down to some of the solution components. And you can make statements like, well, in order to enact this principle, this is traditionally the kind of building blocks that we need to string, to get, string together. Same applies for concerns and views and viewpoints that you're going to touch on just now. So there is my architecture development iteration. Here is my architecture transition iteration. And this is looking at how do I plan to shift the state of the business from state A to state B. And at this level, which is the opportunities and solutions, this is traditionally traditionally with the purest view of solution architecture. There are a variety of organizational models that are affecting this. But this is where my solution architect gets involved. Once I've had an idea of the architectural continuum, and this particular space with all of my architectural building blocks, I then get the solution architect involved who has an under understanding of the solutions continuum. And what particular types of products and solutions can help solve the blueprints that we put on the table. So the solutions architect sits in here. And here is where we look at broadly grouping together initiatives based upon the kind of um, goals and objectives that they fulfill, uh, looking at what's hurting in the business and how we can resolve it with certain products, what we've currently got versus what, what we don't, what must be added. So all of that goes into this bucket and the solution architect helps with that. You then hand that pack over to migration planning. And this is now where the project manager gets involved. But before we give it to that project manager, if as solution architects and enterprise architects, we have decided that coming out of here, we are going to buy, 
then this is traditionally where a request for proposal comes out. So it goes to market, the vendors respond with their time, effort and costs, that information comes back into migration planning so that the business person, sorry, the project manager, can now have a view of the cost and effort. And that's all that happens here is we're looking at cost, effort, resourcing, other projects that are available, critical projects, and we're doing project management techniques to try and align all of these up once again across a strategic, segmented, and a capability layer. So that's what's happening there. That then is handed over into the implementation governance space. Okay, so let's do this. Now, you have an iteration that occurs here, all right? And this isn't documented in TOGAF, so I'm adding the new piece here. And this is called your, um, I'm going to actually call it your implementation iteration. Because at this level here, you have an iteration that occurs there, and this is now referred to as your governance iteration. which circles over implementation governance and architecture change management. So you remember you've got architecture context, which spins around your prelim and your architectural vision phase. You've got an architecture development iteration, which goes around business architecture, IS architecture, and, te and technology architecture. You've then got a architecture transition iteration, which spins around opportunities and solutions and migration planning and you've then got a governance iteration which spins around implementation governance and change management. So those are the iterations that you would cycle with. But on the side of this, you've got an implementation iteration. This is where you actually hand over your project to be implemented either by the vendor or by your development team or any of those teams that you've, you've effectively sorted out. All right, so we've gone through some of those iterations. This is the implementation iteration. And this is effectively where it, the project now gets built by the vendor, by an outsourcer, by my internal development team. All of that occurs here, of which the architects govern that exercise. And they're constantly looking in and they're saying, I gave you this, and what did you deliver for me? And what is the gap? And that is the governance exercise, where they're effectively using checklists for fairly small projects or larger tools like the ATAM, which is the Carnegie Mellon um, 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 an, the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute, one of their tools to measure compliance of your architecture to your business drivers. So it's a good tool which you can use to effectively measure how, how well my implementation is occurring in line with the architectural landscape that I built. So there is, in actual fact, very roughly drawn your ADM and the cycle that, that, will, that, that one works through. Remembering that that can occur across various iterations, it can occur across various segments, and it occurs by using and adding to the building blocks within this particular bucket. Okay. Now, one of the problems that does tend to occur, oh, before, I, before I go there, let me just quickly summarize what happens across phase B, C, and D. So we have business architecture, we have IS architecture, and we have technology architecture. And within these three, there's a pattern that occurs which says, number one, I'm going to look at my stakeholders. I'm going to look at views, viewpoints, and concerns. In other words, the concerns of my stakeholder. I'm then going to look at reference models. In other words, do any exist and can I use them? I'm then also going to look at building blocks. Do any exist that I want to maybe use or create? Then I'm going to do my as-is landscape. I'm going to do my 2B. And I'm going to do my gap analysis. So that's really the pattern that occurs across your architecture development life cycle. Sorry, your architecture development iteration. So you would cycle through that exercise. Now, depending upon the vision for that iteration, it may not necessitate an as-is landscape. So, for example, if the vision of the iteration is around automation of some kind of process, 
let's say creditor management or contact management or something like that. Often you can go through the exercise of building a 2B architecture right down to your application architecture. And at this point here, I can do a gap analysis. I often won't spend my time understanding the full business architecture as a state or the full data architecture as a state. I then understand the as a state of my application architecture and I determine the gap based upon that. If, for example, you're in a reporting project or an information project, then yes, you're going to spend your time doing the as is and the to be for your data architecture. If you are, if the focus of the vision is this particular division is losing revenue or what's going on, it tends to be a business focus, which means I'm going to come in and I'm going to do an as is to be and a gap analysis for my business architecture as well. So you have flexibility to play with your ADM depending upon what the vision is for that iteration and for that partition. Okay, so that's effectively now the tool at this point here, which is going to extract building blocks out and or add into what's referred to as an architectural model. And that architectural model has a variety of ways that we can view it. I'll touch on now a little bit briefly. Um, but let's just take a step back. A, a problem that does occur within the industry is that I have enterprise architecture here. And I have solution architecture here. And we're seeing that a lot of people are selling the concept of enterprise architecture, but they're delivering solution architecture. So business people are expecting the promise of EA, but they're only getting this because individuals, especially those that come from a technical background, are very quick to fall into the solution space. So there's a maturity map that we use, which is based upon the FMARC model. It basically says that I have a fragmented quadrant here, an isolated quadrant here, an optimized quadrant here, and a losing quadrant here. And this dimension relates to my level of architectural thinking. This one relates to the level of that, inter of that thinking and the integration of the thinking into the organization. So a level of integration to the organization. And what this basically says is that at this point here, I can have great architectural thinking, but I'm in effect living in an ivory tower sitting at this level. Business doesn't buy into it. Bright boys sitting in a dark room somewhere, but they're not adding any value. Versus this approach here, which is there, which is where a lot of businesses are, and especially now in the economic times, we're seeing a lot of them falling back down into this quadrant. They're not spending the money here. So they become more tactically focused and not long-term focused. So if companies tend to be tactical, they're going to bounce down this way. And this is a pattern that companies follow. When they start to think strategically, they tend to move up that way. When they become tactical, they tend to drop back down to the fragmented quadrant. And this is the pattern that occurs, depending upon what's happening in the the economy at the time. So in this space here, it's very solution focused and project focused. It doesn't necessarily look at the broader enterprise. It looks very much at just this particular burning platform that we need to address. So one needs to get to the point where we eventually move into this optimized quadrant and there are a variety of strategies which can do that. For example, um, there is a digression and a pincer movement strategy. So some, some of our clients sit within this space. So we, we do a digression approach. Let me do a different color so that at least we can see the difference here. So they would start here and effectively digress in two different directions with two separate teams. And later on, sometimes up to 18 months later, they would then bring these two teams together into a pincer movement at this level. And that is what's referred to as an architecture strategy. That's all about... How do we improve the maturity of our architectural practice over time? And what techniques do we need to do to follow this? And this is something that we do in the industry is we help you mature both dimensions of this across a specific roadmap with all of the tools, templates, and packs that one must uh, utilize to do that. So that, this now tends to be very much solution architecture focused realm 
Right? And this tends to be very much enterprise architecture focused ROM. Or maybe a better way for us to view it is actually just look at the two dimensions. And we say that solution architects tend to follow that way and the enterprise architects tend to follow that way. We now have a situation, and this is what's occurring in the industry, is that a gap exists between what the EAs provide and what the SAs have to deliver. And because of that gap, the SAs tend to fill in the gaps, and this generates a risk. Or you do what's referred to as a retrofitting of your architecture. In other words, the SAs don't have enough information, so they start inventing stuff themselves, which often isn't in line with this. So they start failing their compliance reviews. Um, but there is a risk that you simply need to manage. And this is a journey that one must travel. So as you move around these two quadrants, uh, effectively your SAs and your EAs are flexing their muscles together. Now the problem is, is the EA and the SA domain tend to work quite well together until you introduce another domain which is the program management office. And this is often where EA starts to lose its value. It starts to lose its value in a world where we say this is a causal loop and we have a problem on this side in which we have to provide a solution on this side. And the EA would traditionally sit within the world of big picture, long-term approach, saving money over the long term, not immediate value. But on this side, we have the PMO, or the Project Management Office, who has a causal loop which actually is resistant against that. So they've got certain drivers on this side, which is delivery. Okay. So they've also got to deliver a project. But the problem is they've, their metrics are on cost and timelines. Whereas at this particular level here, the EAs have a different metric. And here you can see the PMO effort is resisting the EA effort. And these two worlds collide in the middle and create tension, which often gets to the point of the PMO saying the EAs are slowing the process down. They're not adding value, etc., etc. And a lot of politics occurs within these causal loops. And in actual fact, if you look at the external, the external cause, it's often because everyone is measured quarterly. And in today's world, you're not measured based upon a solution that's good for the business in three or four or five years. You're not even measured on annually. You're measured quarterly. And because people are measured quarterly, it's causing the project managers who deal with measurement, time and cost, to put quarterly me metrics onto a group of thinkers that are trying to think big picture. And this is often what occurs within the industry and tends to damage uh, the architectural landscape. And that's why, for example, we've taken some of the architectural or let's call it some of the archetypes for systemic thinking, and we've applied it to enterprise architecture, which you've seen just a brief view of one of them. So what we've got to do now is we've got to try and bring this level down to where there's only a 20% gap. And that's about a, a good, safe tolerance level for how accurate my architecture must be. So I've got to be able to reduce my risk all the way down until eventually I've got to... So here we're probably looking at about an 80% gap if I'm in these kind of quadrants. And I want to be able to slowly move down until I get a 20%. So there's a path that I'm going to travel. And you're going to use architectural governance to measure each step that you take. And in here, you're going to do what I, we already spoke about earlier, which is architecture iteration. And you, you're going to do your context and your architectural development iteration here, your development iteration here, and your transition iteration. So you're just going to work through different levels. We've got, a, we've got various packs that one talk you through this, for example. This is one of the packs that we particularly work with. It takes you through the risk and exercise involved in iterating all the way down until we eventually have um, a fairly close alignment between the solution architecture and the enterprise architecture landscape. So there's a couple of those packs that we can equip you with. So that's effectively the journey that, we, that we're trying to travel as we move along. Now, if that isn't enough for us to consider, we've got a slightly more complex, well, not more complex, but let's call it emerging discipline because it's only recently reared its head in TOGAF 9. And so one of the areas that we contributed to, and these are the, the, the disciplines of enterprise architecture or the capabilities of enterprise architecture, or in other words, the business of enterprise architecture. So in other words, how do I do enterprise architecture? And there are a variety of disciplines. Right? And, they, and they relate, they range from strategic management, 
to risk management, to financial management, to service management, to um, capability management. Uh, there's a couple of others that slip my mind at the moment. So there's effectively 12 disciplines that we've fleshed out. And they, they apply specifically to the architectural discipline. And in most organizations, the first couple that we try and get through the door is governance management, is uh, performance management, and value management, and financial management. But you want to get to the point where I can, on all of these building blocks, I can put a figure associated to it. And we have, we have, we've got a value model in which we not only look at just cost, but we build what's referred to as a value index. And the value index relates to my performance index, and it's how well did it perform plus its cost. And all of this information is attached to my building block, which sits in the bottom here. So that over time, I can determine the value of each of those building blocks. But this model must be in place to start with. So some of the key things that I want to do when I come out the starting block as an architectural um, capability is have those models in place, plus models which measure the performance of my architecture. So if I built an architectural model up here, right, or let's look at this one, if I built a very good architectural model, but it wasn't well integrated into the organization, in other words, it didn't work, well, what's the repercussions of that? How am I measured according to that? Similarly, in, 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 in within your operating model, you've got what's referred to as EA engagement processes. And that says, well, how do I interact with my stakeholder? Do I put a completely abstract thinker in front of a project manager? So in that particular example, we deal with what are referred to as colors of change, in which we help you measure your architects based upon the change color that they are. And we measure your stakeholders based upon the change color that they are. And we make sure that we put the right person in front of the right stakeholder, and that they're not giving the wrong message. Remember we spoke earlier about selling EA but only delivering solution architecture, same problem applies there. So there's some colors of change, which is a well-known change model. And it basically says that we have a yellow change thinker who thinks you can only change an organization with politics. We then have a blue change thinker, which thinks you can only change your organization through projects. We have a red change thinker, which thinks you can change it through people. We have a green change thinker, which thinks you can change it through knowledge and training. And we have a white space thinker who doesn't believe that any coherent mechanism there is a sense of chaos that occurs and there's a pattern of change that works its way through that chaos. Now imagine putting a white change thinker in front of a blue stakeholder. This can create some problems. Messages are completely different and that's often the case that we find in architectural domains. And you have maverick architects causing quite a lot of damage in organizations because they're actually passing on the wrong message. And there is your EA engagement model. Your EA artifacts of benefit logic and communication messages from um, your change management side that you can go and sit in front of a stakeholder and you can say, right, this is what we're doing for you and you're talking his or her language. Very, very important. It's all the pink and fluffy stuff, but that's what's been missing within the architectural domain. So as I build out an EA operating model for the 12 disciplines or capabilities, those are going to vary depending upon my maturity. Right, so here is value. Here is scope. And here we have EA equals IT architecture. And here we have EA equals enterprise-wide IT architecture. And here we have EA equals business architecture plus enterprise-wide IT architecture. And here we have EA equals strategic architecture plus business architecture plus enterprise-wide IT architecture. So that is a, a level of maturity that EA is seen within the business. Now, in fact, most organizations within the EA practice are playing here. However, the value of EA has been pitched here. So these are all the elements that they've referred to that can provide actual value for the business from an EA perspective. So what we have to do is bridge this divide. And this is your EA strategy. And guess what? We use the ADM to do exactly the same thing. Over here, there is a business architecture. And over here, there is a 2B business architecture. And in the middle, there is a gap. So my, my organization, my enterprise architecture organization has to change from this state to that state in exactly the same way 
as we build architecture roadmaps. And each of these models is going to be different all the way through. So my governance framework is going to be vastly different here than what it is over there. Because here I'm dealing just with IT. Here I'm dealing with full-scale corporate governance and how to mix in with overall enterprise governance, all of those complexities. So there's a path that you're going to need to travel. And as you travel that path, you're going to bounce around this particular maturity. Each step you make forward, you'll probably bounce down to one of either of the losing quadrant, right, or either isolated or fragmented. And then as you get your maturity up within that particular section, you're then going to make incursions further, further on up. So that's ultimately what I want to do to bridge this space here. How am I going to move up? And I'm going to create bridging efforts on certain projects into each of these domains depending upon the level that I'm operating at. Some of that might occur overtly and some of that might occur covertly. And that is your EA strategy at an overt and a covert level. In other words, some things I can do that everybody can see, we're helping a project deliver. Other stuff is a little too political, so we're going to maneuver accordingly to be able to try and push up further into that maturity layer. Right, so that is effectively the whole maturity landscape and trying to add value to an organization, but value where it counts, not selling them one thing and delivering another. We have to get to the point where business people see the value of enterprise architecture because there's a trend which is occurring. It's basically saying that, okay, we believe that architecture can solve our problem. Right, we haven't seen delivery, we haven't seen delivery, so it's plateauing out here. And like any new product that's introduced, we have to try and introduce to get us to the next level. So we have to try and identify what that is. And we believe that that domain is called enterprise planning. And that is now moving up into the away from the building block scope, back up into the differentiator, the true value of enterprise architecture. And enterprise planning consists of a variety of differences. It's it, refer, it consists of business planning, two-thirds of business analytics, right? uh, business intelligence, and the glorious enterprise architecture. So we want to wrap all of those together. That's going to help us do enterprise planning, which is going to push us up further this space. It's yet another buzzword, you say, not really. It's just a, a grouping together of technologies and or methods and techniques that already exist out there. But we need to be thinking in this space. But we're not delivering effectively here because we're not thinking building block, putting out too many fires. So our architectural efforts aren't working here. So business people are not seeing the value that is being promised to them here. And we can help you achieve some of that through some of our models. Okay, so that has effectively giving you a view into now applying the ADM across different levels of maturity. Remember, I've got a team sitting on this side. So here is my architectural capability. And this team is operating at different levels of maturity. Okay, so we've got our quadrant graph here. And we've got our value and scope graph. They are doing these things, all right? to ultimately enable my business capability, which is sitting on the side. And all my operating model. In other words, how I do business. And that's why I believe that architecture has to report to that man, chief operations officer, and not the CIO or the CTO. Because that man is responsible for the operations of the business. Okay, so, Let's just touch lightly on our next point here, which is the architectural model. Right. And the architectural model is really giving you a view of your organization at different states across different times. And the architectural model is the outcome of me using the architecture developer method to pull building blocks out and build this architectural model. So now let's come back to the first part that we spoke about, which is process and function. So sitting at the top here, you have something called process. And here you have function. Traditionally in this landscape, we'll have a function. This function will have an input and an output. 
there will be people that will perform this function and or machines. Okay? And there will be guidelines associated to this. Or policies, procedures, controls, those kind of things. Look familiar to anyone? It's an IDF0 diagram. But this is traditionally the, a nice, I like it, a rounded syntax. It's a syntax to document the functional landscape. Sitting at the top here, you might have other tools like BPMN, which can deal with the complexities of automating business processes. But there's a, a little alarm bell that has to go on here around this particular separation and how we automate these processes. So um, let me just talk around so and now. Let's just take a digression. We've got a new language, which now the open group has bought out, and it's called Archimate. And in a very quick summary, as a WSDL is to a web service, so Archimate is to your building block. So if we're all talking the same language, we all know what an application means, and then through that language, we're talking the same modeling techniques and the same syntax to model that and layer it and represent views and viewpoints, then when we all meet in the middle in this grand inter-enterprise mix, we can talk the same language and we can get to the true state of swapping building blocks. And that is where SOA has failed. SOA has tended to only implement this stuff here at the technical level. A variety of other issues which I'll touch on just now. But at the architectural level, which is just the modeling space, there's not a common language there that we could talk to make sure that we were talking about the same thing. And that is what Archimat is hoping to bring to the equation. And as part of our advanced training, we give you um, a day on the Archimate syntax and how to use that to layer and to model ac according to different views and viewpoints, etc., etc. But there's a language that is going to gain a whole lot more popularity specifically for documenting architectures. All right, so remember now we had a function and we had a process. In exactly the same way, you have something here right, referred to as a view and a viewpoint. And that view and viewpoint showed how you assembled your building blocks. So over here, I have a grouping of building blocks that I've taken from this bucket. I assemble them in a particular way that matters to this particular stakeholder. Remember we spoke about the coffee example? So this would be, whatever, a COO or something to that extent. And he has a variety of concerns. Now these concerns are not requirements. They're longer lasting. So there is a concern of, I'm concerned about the attrition of my staff. I'm concerned about the economic impact on the company. Uh, I'm concerned about flexibility, let's sort of take or performance of my systems for my customers. So those are concerns. He also has requirements. And requirements tend to be shorter term. And those tend to drive the space here. But this tends to drive this. So now I have a COO who comes from a particular viewpoint. Let's just, for simplicity's sake, call it a COO viewpoint. And over here, I have a view which represents that stakeholder's concerns. And I represent that view as a model. And that model is effectively taking all of these building blocks and assembling them in a way that he understands. If I combine all of my models together, I get an architectural model. And this is where we are here. Yeah. And the only thing that goes in your architectural model are the views that matter to your stakeholder. And this is often what happens in architecture. We've got bright boys producing fantastic wallware, great diagrams, but they're building it for this architectural landscape. The CEO or the key sponsors or people that control the purse, they look at it and they have no idea what's being represented because we haven't understood our stakeholder, we haven't understood our customer properly. So that is what the whole purpose of views and viewpoints is. It's saying, tell me your process, tell me your semantics, so that I can represent that as a view, finally as a model, in an overall architectural model, 
And if I put all of my stakeholders with all of their views in here, I have my architectural model for the organization. And that is what an architectural model is. No, no more, no less. I don't put artifacts in here that don't have a stakeholder. I don't put models and views in here that don't have a stakeholder. All of that is not relevant. Putting stuff in there, which is what we refer to as four-fifths worth of effort. And so it's wasted effort. So ultimately, I need to be able to create the separation. And, and that is all the views and viewpoints and concerns are. There's a, there's a lot of debate going on about views and viewpoints. People don't tend to understand it. But all that it is, is a semantic way of me encapsulating how my customer sees the world. Right? And then how to assemble all of my building blocks to show that customer. So let's take Lego, for example. The little instructions you get to assemble your Lego set is in actual fact a view. And it is the assembler's view. Right? And it's coming from the customer's perspective, who's got uh, certain concerns that he wants to get enjoyment out of building a Lego car. So along the way, I ha now take all of the Lego building blocks and I take it out of the box that it comes in. And I use my view, which is the instructions, to assemble those building blocks into the car that I was looking for originally. And that's the space of the architectural domain. That's what we're doing. And that is what this particular gentleman has done. Right? John Zachman has effectively built exactly that. He has a series of viewpoints down the side. The planner, the owner, the designer, the builder, the subcontractor. And there's a series of views across the top. And therefore, at the intersection of each of these is a particular view based upon that viewpoint. And it's represented by a model. Not to the, the extraneous degree that one should have in here, but you can see here where there is an intersection of the what slash data view with the owner viewpoint. You can see here there's a thing called a semantic model. So it is referring to the model okay, required to represent the data view right, for that particular viewpoint, contextual. I think it was the owner. So that is all that this is doing. If you are in an organization and you go through this exercise of applying architecture over and over again, building your architectural models like this, guess what? You will have built your own enterprise reference model for your organization. You don't need this. And all that you're doing is you're building the common sets of views, viewpoints, and models for all of the stakeholders that exist across your organization. So that's where the different worlds come in. So sitting on this side, now, is all of my stakeholders, all of their views and viewpoints represented as a reference model. And it's how they view this architectural model, which in turn is how we assemble with this method all of our building blocks through the exercise to match those particular views in the architectural model. So we've catered for semantics. So this world caters for building blocks and common stuff, the what. This world caters for the how, in other words, the function, the semantic space. Here is my coffee landscape. And here is my how I make coffee landscape. So even within the meta structure of TOGAF, there is the separation between process and function. We wouldn't call a view and viewpoint process, but you understand the separation it's his particular semantic view of the world, as opposed to how I assemble all of these building blocks to give me my particular view. Now you have that occurring over time. So here is my architectural model. Over time, three, four, five years, I have an architectural model one, architectural model two, and architectural model three. Which, by the way, was a representation of a certain group of stakeholders at that particular point in time. Right? And some of them might have left, some of them might have stayed, so we know who was there at the time. And so we know what the architecture of the enterprise looked like, what the organization looked like. This is called the architecture landscape. And it also goes across the strategic, Augmented and compatibility. 
So this has told me what my organization has looked like over time. So I can now say in FY2000 and FY2001 and maybe FY, let's just 2002. These are the kind of revenues that I had and how the company performed maybe at a profit level. But the beauty of this exercise is I can now marry this data to how my enterprise actually looked because I have an exact representation of the architectural model of the enterprise with the individuals across the business data application and technology at certain points in time. So now I can determine, okay, well, why did we lose revenue or profit at this particular point? Well, this is how the organization changed. So I'm in a far better position to understand the workings of my car. So if we see your business as an entire car, the engine is the technology and the people that pull the car forward. Board of directors are steering the car, getting information back from the dashboard, looking out through the windscreen, looking at the strategy, the landscape, competitors overtaking them, accelerating, slowing down, overtaking. It's the enterprise architect's job to know how that whole car fits together as one system. Because you can have a Ferrari engine in there, but if you've got one of your wheels that aren't balanced properly, that small little piece of lead is going to slow you down. So you need to look at the whole element as a system. And this is, this is now the space where we're getting to enterprise planning, which I can apply business intelligence techniques here, but specifically to see, okay, how did my car look there? How did my car look here? How did my car look? What changed? Did I put different wheels on? Maybe we decided to, to undercut a competitor, so we didn't stay on the road, we went off-road, and therefore we put slower tires on, but they could last us longer. So all of that we need to be able to put on the table. And there's very few organizations that are at this level. This is top right quadrant. This is optimizing space. So now we can help the business make decisions. This is EA as a strategic enabler. So that now we've shown the value. Now we drive projects as EAs. We don't get projects given to us by PMO. PMO take the roadmap from us. We guide and govern them. And that's the true route that we need to particularly follow. So this is the architectural landscape. This is enterprise planning. Because remember that even at this level, so here's the value chain. If we think BI, here, here's my customers, here's my suppliers. BI tends to look at the, uh, the ends of the value chain. How much money did we make? And profit did we make? But often is blind here. And is not able to detail, link performance of a company to an actual fact how it actually looked on the ground. The technology, the people, the processes, how well did they perform, all that stuff sits in the middle here. And this is the EA space, not solution architecture. It's a space to show you this model over time. TOGAF gives you all of that. But people still see TOGAF as a technology tool, and it's not. Enterprise architecture is not a technology tool. It is a tool that is going to change the state of your business from one state to another. So people will then say, well, why does it have a technology architecture phase? Because that's where its legacy came from. TOGAF 7 was heavily entrenched in, the, in that space. But a similar question we have in the Department of Defense is, if you mention the word technology to a colonel or a general, he's going to think quite differently from how the traditional landscape thinks of technology. A colonel will see technology as gunpowder whereas we would might think of it as servers and desktops. So even in those two contexts, they're vastly different of how one would view technology. So when we see, use the word technology, come out of the box, don't think of it as technology bits and bytes, think broader. When I use the word application, come out of the box, don't think a software application. Think of how I can apply my business to solve a problem. And you start to think a little broader in that space. So this is effectively TOGAF. A long variety of whole lot of other little tools along the way, standards information base, some small elements on capability, etc., etc., that work in the space. They've added through the ADM here, you've got, for example, a SOAS style and you've got a security element as well. So these are the two styles that they've added. So SOA is not about technology. SOA is all about the style of how I do enterprise architecture. 
and that's now what's been added to the ADM. So let's just touch lightly on SOA. SOA talks about capabilities and business services and all of those things. And all of those definitions marry perfectly into this structure here. So let's take a SOA reference model. So we'll take it from either common or an industry-based one. So right down at the bottom here, I will have some source systems. I will extract information into a services layer, which is of two types, information and function. I will then group like services together into business services. And all we're putting, all we're doing here is we're putting all the kitchenware in the kitchen, all the bathroomware in the bathroom. No process added. It's a like grouping of like content. And that is the definition of a building block. So your building blocks actually begin to take shape here at this business services layer. Then here, we'll have a composite business service. And all I do is I take this, I add process, I now get a composite business service. So now my process layer comes in. Well, where did my functional layer come in, you might ask? Well, it is there. So here is my what. And here is my how. So you can see how SOA has followed very, very similar principles. Then right at the top here, I add my user. And I get a composite business application. And that's an example of a reference model, a stack for SOA. But let's take a step back here. What TOGAF and architecture gives you is it gives you a way to do functional decomposition. A function is, very, is quite synonymous to a service. So I can say all of my functionality right, for, is exposed via services. If I group like functionality together using things, various techniques that we can teach you, I would get a building block, right? which is, in a, if I'm wearing a SOA hat, is referred to as a business service. If I'm wearing a traditional hat, it's referred to as an application with exposed functionality. If I then add process on top of that, I get a composite business service if I'm wearing my hat. Depending upon the level that I'm working on, I might get a BPM process that strings multiple applications together. So all of those layers work quite well here. So in my business architecture landscape, when I do business architecture, I'm doing it here. So here is my business architecture. Here is my business architecture. Then I go to my data architecture. Well, my data architecture I get from my business architecture. And through linguistic analysis, etc., etc., I identify the data that I need and I can expose those as services. Master data management, information as a service, those things start to take shape. Then I have an application architecture, which is really a business services architecture, which is grouping together like information or like function. And this is now my application or my information systems architecture phase helping me there. I then have a technology phase, which is actually sitting behind this. And there are three landscapes that it works with. Execution. How do I run? Operations. How do I manage? Development. How do I build? So you use technical reference models, which we get from here. And we ask questions like, how am I going to run this business service or this application? How am I going to operate it? How am I going to build it? And through a series of matrices, you're going to effectively plot your technical reference model with your application and come up with common stuff that occurs across your business to give you a building block, this level, or commonality, another technical reference model that can outcome. And that occurs through each iteration. 
every time I go through the ADM, whether it's SOA or Legacy, whatever the case might be, working through cycles like this, all about building blocks, collecting common stuff. Once all those building blocks are there, I've got agility. I string them together in a certain way. So that is effectively the SOA space. A lot more complex, but the quick bird's eye view, they've linked it to business services, to functions, to processes, to capabilities, capabilities across market models and all the rest of that, but you can come do some TOGAF training with us and we can fill you in a little more detail on that one. So finally, just to close off, and uh, no architectural exercise is complete without just a little better understanding of a magic little matrix called a CRUD matrix. Now what happens is in my business architecture world, I'm going to start with my first iterations which are a functional view of the world. In other words, what the business does. Tell me what the business does. And that is going to give me a functional decomposition. Uh, and way down here, you could have something like approve, leave. So I'm going to use that noun, linguistic analysis, to help me identify my data. And I'm going to build something called a CRUD matrix. So here is going to be my function, my lowest level, approve, leave. They are my classes, objects, entities, however you want to refer to them. And you're going to do this across your architecture for that iteration, whether it's strategic, segmented, or capability for the partition, and depending on what, what, how deep you are in the iteration. And you're going to build an order through various techniques like affinity analysis, like clustering, etc., etc., a CRUD matrix, which is going to look like this. And this CRUD matrix, you must at least do it once in your architectural life. You can get machines and tools that do it. It's going to tell you a couple of things. It's going to tell you, I am grouping like functionality together that does like stuff on data. And that is the definition of a building block. If I'm wearing my SOA hat, this is a business service. If I'm wearing my legacy or my or another hat, this is an application. So it's grouped together like functionality. Similarly, over here, I'm creating leave, and I'm updating it, and over here, I'm reading it, and I'm also updating. This is telling me that there is a link that exists. Because the CRUD matrix, all it talks about is CRUD. Create, read, update, and delete. How does this function create, read, update, and delete on that data? So this particular line is telling me that there is an interface point that exists between these two business services or applications. That's what it's telling me. So this is a view of my interface, this particular level. When I do a functional decomposition, at this level here, remember we showed you a mechanism? So this is a person who's working on it. There is input. Here is output. My functional decomposition. This person has a location. So input and output goes there. My function goes over here, and we'll show you where location comes just now. So this has given me a view into my beginning phases of my integration architecture. Similarly, this route here is doing something the same. It's starting to show me, with no rules and events yet, but the beginnings of a process architecture. And if I look this way, if I stand here and I look this way, I'm looking functionally centric. So this becomes a functionally centric application. So customer opens account versus vertically down this way. If I'm looking up this way, I'm looking up that way and it might just be customer management or product management. So it's more data centric. Then there are various techniques that we show you on the CRUD matrix which talk around how often certain classes are read. So this gives us a class that is hit 2,000, 20,000 times, whatever the case may be. Now, that is giving us a very quick view into our information as a service. So this gets exposed as information as a service because it's a common utility service that gets used a lot. Similarly, over here, I can have functions that are used quite often along this way. And this now becomes my utility function service. And if you remember the SOA layers, we refer to the services layer having two types, information and function. Well, there they are, identified for you. 
So the CRUD matrix goes a long way to help you understand link. This is where it actually all comes together. Important point to remember is that now if I build my process architecture on the side here, normally a level zero, level one, maybe level two, these guys string together, they use certain functionality of these building blocks. Here's your process architect again. Semantically linking certain functionality, exposed functionality. Similarly, inside here, I'm also going to have to have a process, which is maybe my level four or five. It's going to talk about the business rules of how, of what occurs inside there. And that is where we get to the world of granularity and atomicity. So here, I will have fine-grained and coarse-grained. Here, I will have atomic and composite. This axis is functional. This axis is process. So I can talk about high granularity or coarse granularity. So the bigger this block, the more coarse it becomes versus the fine grain stuff like maybe one function or one data. So that's fine. Then there's atomicity, which is the process. So depending upon how big my process is, I might have a large process like this, which is linking together quite a lot of building blocks, which means I have a composite process. Versus way down here, I might quite have a small process. Or even here on authentication or something like that, I may have a very small process that hits there. And that tends to be more an atomic process. So you can see how those elements fit in quite well with this particular space here. All that it tends to occur within your information systems architecture. So CRUD matrix is quite key for us to work with. And just to finish off, I'm not going to take you through the full ADM. But ultimately, we want to get some kind of roadmap. We want to understand what technology to use. So let's stick within the, not the gunpowder domain, but the normal traditional technology landscape. First pass of my CRUD matrix, by the way, is my groupings. And that is my core delivery path. It actually gives me sequence of things. So this is the first thing. And often in a CRUD matrix, what bubbles to the top tend to be your common functions, common things that occur across your business and often give you an idea of your layered building blocks. So if I'm on a TRM, and I've got maybe five or six layers, they tend to reflect these guys here, show you the common stuff. Or, in TOGAF triple RM terms, or TRM terms, the infrastructure applications, as opposed to more the business-related applications down this way. So there your CRUD matrix once again helps you determine some of those elements. Okay. And then finally, what we'll do is, once again, through a series of matrices, which you can automate, I'll have an application. I want to know, guess what, how it's run. I want to know how it's developed. And I want to know how it's operated. And you will go through a cycle of using a reference model, the top of each of these, to determine how I'm going to do these tasks. And for example, my execution environment could be a host-based reference model. It could be a client-server-based reference model. It could be a virtualization-based reference model. It could be web-centric. So that's the reference model that you slot in the top here. And you look for commonality of technical components across your organization. And that is going to give you a technical architecture and eventually a technical inventory that you're going to work with. And in the, in the earlier on, in the application, or sorry, in the information system space, we do what's referred to the Quality Attributes Workshop, which takes in all of your, your illities, or your <laughs> illities, flexibility, performance, reliability, all of those things, and you bring those elements to bear on here to determine, do I need a small, medium, or large server? And that's the spec that you would give to your solution architect to work with. So that's where the technology architecture now finishes. But there's still one gap missing. And the final gap that we need to plug is how does all of this link to my solution architecture? So, guess what architect, architectural artifact we use for that? 
that is a curve matrix. So here is my function, here is my data, and I have created certain mappings. Now, each of these boundaries is a grouping of like functionality. And I've identified an application for each, or a business service. Let's refer to an application for our example. So and then, in the use case world, I have a use case model. This boundary is the same as this boundary. So if this was application X, Y, Z, that was A, B, and C, we would have two use case models for A, B, C, X, Y, Z. A use case is a representation of a functional. It's a functional tool. It's not a process tool. It's goal-based. Now, all of the functions that sit within that grouping become my use cases in the use case model. And similarly, this line here becomes that line there. And starts to show me how these worlds interact with each other. And then I have an actor which has to interact with that function. Earlier on, I showed you the function and how it was related to our UDEF definition. And over here, there was a mechanism that implemented that function, and I said location. This person is that person. And at the technical level, I know that that person is located, for example, in New York. And another person might be located in London. So I know that they are performing the same functions, but they're doing them in different parts of the world. So it either means that I must distribute my data, create a wide area network, that starts to guide some of my technical decisions, which will find their way down into the implementation and deployment model at a UML level. So ultimately, there is my link to the use case model. I now take the data, and it's going to help me identify my classes. Here's my actor in a system sequence diagram. That actor is working through a series of classes. The noun helps me identify the data here. In other words, approve leave. So leave is the noun. That helped me identify that. Approve is the verb. And this helped me identify the operation here. So that the link becomes a little more robust. These are your life cycles. In here is, depending upon my atomicity and granularity, the process that needs to be operated with. Once again, depending upon what level. So in there is now my process architecture. So the process landscape comes in here. And this is an activity diagram. So we've got a use case model, system sequence diagram, activity diagrams. The link into the solutions design space is becoming more robust. So this is now the world of the solution architect downwards that now takes it to this level and designs it but he's got his links in he understands how it all works we're getting a closer link between ea and sa we're reducing the gap from 80 percent to 20 percent and that is the enterprise architecture discipline using the togeth framework similarities around a variety of others for example the eap approach by spuak very similar. It's almost like the forefather of the method space. And a lot of the other methods all follow very, very similar approaches in creating business architecture, etc., etc. They've just created more complexity around reference models and some of the deeper um, frameworks that would be applied. So, although we call this TOGAF, it's a lot of the concepts can be used across all your other frameworks. So that, in a nutshell, is your TOGAF landscape. of Taking building blocks, assembling them in a particular way that an individual can understand to cater for semantics, to cater for reuse, to cater for agility, to automate, not necessarily automate, but move the state of a business from one state to another. And in that short period of time is your TOGAF summary. It takes five days to get certified, so this gets stretched out and a lot more meat, a lot more examples, a lot more detail for you to walk away with a TOGAF certification. But in most situations, if you were to read the TOGAF book, you would not get this and that's where we can help you from a mentoring perspective, guide you through things like iTech certification, guide you through a variety of, for example, our value model, how we build value into building blocks, how we bridge the gap between the enterprise architecture and the solution space. This is the broader how we build an EA strategy, 
This is more detail around how we link EA to the use case models and the solution models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We, we talk around the views and viewpoints landscape, how all of this links together. How do we actually build value by linking to balanced scorecards and strategy maps? What are the core artifacts for for TOGAF that we can use when we do governance? measurements upwards and downwards and where does the continuum all of those things fit in together this is the value that we bring to the table uh, in equipping you to number one from a training perspective and number two from a consulting perspective to make architecture a valuable asset within your organization thank you very much